Cheers. Welcome to Learning English, a daily 30-minute program from the Voice of America. I'm Jonathan Evans. And I'm Ashley Thompson. This program is aimed at English learners. So we speak a little slower and we use words and phrases especially written for people learning English. Today on the program, you will hear from Alice Bryant and Brian Lynn. Later, we will present our American history series, The Making of a Nation. But first, here is Alice Bryant. Shodai Oriden got her first tattoo on a trip to Australia nearly 30 years ago. Now she is tattooed from head to foot. She even has tattoos on the skin on her head. Horiren is one of Japan's most well-known traditional tattoo artists. Your house gets old, your parents die, you break up with a lover, kids grow and go, she said. But a tattoo is with you until you die and are buried. The 52-year-old spoke with Reuters reporters from her tattoo business north of Tokyo. Horiren belongs to a growing group of Japanese tattoo lovers who reject cultural taboos connected with this art form. They are turning their skin into colorful pictures with complex, full-body designs. Often, these designs involve images from ancient Japanese stories. In Japan, tattoos are banned from bathhouses, hot spring areas, some beaches, and many places where people swim and exercise. For hundreds of years, tattoos in Japan have been seen as things criminals have. Most recently, they have been linked to members of the Yakuza, an organized crime group. Yakuza members full-body images end at the hands and neck, helping them hide the tattoos under clothing. But tattoo fans in Japan hope opinions will change. They believe that popular foreign sports stars with tattoos will help bring about this change. That includes athletes from the 2020 Rugby World Cup and the Tokyo Olympic Games set for next year. If you watch the All Blacks do the haka with their tattoos, it makes your heart beat faster, Oriren said. She was talking about New Zealand's national rugby team and their ceremonial dance. Mari Okasaka got her first tattoo when she was 28. Now 48, Okasaka says, some people get tattoos for deep reasons. But she said she does it for fashion, the same way she might buy a nice piece of clothing. Okasaka's 24-year-old son, Tenji, hopes to one day have his whole body covered in imagery and colors. Rie Yoshihara works in a shop that lets vacationers try on traditional kimono clothing. She said her father has still not seen her full back tattoo. And Mara Okasaka covers her arms when she goes outside so her neighbors will not talk badly about her. 
Still, many tattoo wearers are less afraid now to show their body art. They can be seen at large parties showing their tattoos to others. Takashi Mikajiri is a surfer who works in the television industry. He says he is still sometimes stopped by officials at beaches and ordered to cover his tattoos. In America, if you have a tattoo, people don't really care, Mikajiri said. There's not really any reaction. Hiroyuki Namoto is a party organizer and scrapyard worker. He said of himself and others, We may have tattoos, but we are happy and bright people. I'm Alice Bryant. The United States officially withdrew from the Paris Agreement to fight climate change on Wednesday. Leaders from around the world approved the agreement in 2015 at a conference in the French capital. For more than two years, American President Donald Trump talked about withdrawing from the treaty. Last year, the Trump administration announced the U.S. decision to withdraw. However, the results of the presidential election could decide for how long. Trump's main opponent in the vote, former Vice President Joe Biden, has promised to rejoin the climate agreement if he is elected. More than 180 countries. Remain committed to the 2015 Paris Accord. The agreement aims to limit the increase in average temperatures worldwide to well below 2 degrees Celsius and ideally no more than 1.5 degrees Celsius. Those increases are compared to temperature levels before Europe's Industrial Revolution. Scientists say that any temperature increase greater than 2 degrees Celsius could have a disastrous effect on large parts of the world. Such an increase, they say, could raise sea levels, fuel powerful storms, and worsen droughts and floods. The Paris Accord requires countries to set their own targets for cutting production of carbon dioxide. And other gases linked to rising temperatures. The only legal requirement is that national governments must truthfully report on their efforts. The United States is the world's second biggest producer of heat trapping gases after China. In recent weeks, China, Japan, and South Korea have joined the European Union. And other countries in setting national targets to stop pumping more greenhouse gases into the atmosphere. Biden, the Democratic Party's candidate for president, has said he supports calls for the United States to return to the Paris Accord. On Wednesday, Germany's government said it was highly regrettable that the United States had left the accord. It's all the more important that Europe, the EU, and Germany lead by example, government spokesman Paul Seibert said. While the Trump administration has rejected federal measures to cut greenhouse gases, Seibert noted that U.S. states, cities, and businesses have pushed ahead with their own efforts.
Researchers are working on machine learning systems to identify COVID-19 cases by the sounds of a person's cough. One system has demonstrated a high success rate in detecting COVID-19 in people with no physical signs of the disease. Such a tool could be important in the fight against COVID-19, which can be spread by people who do not even know they are infected. Researchers at the Massachusetts Institute of Technology, MIT, recently published a paper reporting results of the system. The team created an artificial intelligence model to examine the sounds of people who produced a forced cough. The sounds were collected from people who recorded them on computers or mobile devices. The individuals were also asked to provide information about any symptoms they were experiencing as well as whether they had been officially tested for COVID-19. People then sent the recordings and data to researchers through the Internet or their devices. Researchers reported they had received more than 70,000 recordings, amounting to about 200,000 individual cough examples. The team then trained the model on the cough sounds, as well as spoken words. When the new cough recordings were fed into the system, it correctly identified 98.5% of coughs from people confirmed to have COVID-19, the researchers reported. The model also detected 100% of coughs in people who reported they had tested positive for the virus but had no signs of the disease. One of the project's leaders is Brian Subarana, a research scientist in MIT's Auto ID Laboratory. Subarana and his team had already been developing AI models to examine forced coughed recordings to search for signs of Alzheimer's disease. Such signs can include changes in personality and memory loss, but Alzheimer's can also cause nerve and muscle problems, including weakened speech. The MIT team says its latest model trained to identify Alzheimer's disease from cough sounds had also shown good progress as a possible way to help detect the condition. So when the coronavirus pandemic developed, Subarana told MIT News he thought the same model structure might work for COVID-19. This is because there was evidence that COVID-19 infected individuals may also experience voice muscle weakness. Subarana said the researchers discovered a striking similarity in the ability of the model to detect Alzheimer's and COVID-19. The experiment showed that the way a person produces sound changes if they are infected with COVID-19, even if no physical signs are present, he added. The team says it is working to develop a user-friendly app that could be used on a wide basis to detect COVID-19 cases. 
This would make it possible for users to cough into their phone and receive immediate information on whether they might be infected and should seek an official test. The effective use of such a tool could also diminish the spread of the pandemic if everyone uses it before going to a classroom, a factory, or a restaurant, Subirana explained. U.S. researchers at Pennsylvania's Carnegie Mellon University are also using machine learning methods to develop a voice-based testing system for COVID-19. That system also uses recordings of coughs as well as some vowel sounds and the alphabet to identify signatures of the virus, the Pittsburgh Post-Gazette reported. And in Britain, a similar project is being carried out by engineers at the University of Cambridge. Researchers working on that system reported in July they had created a machine learning tool that could correctly identify COVID-19 cases based on cough and breath sounds. Those models performed with a success rate of about 80% in laboratory tests, the team reported. I'm Brian Lynn. Welcome to The Making of a Nation, American History in VOA Special English. Years of disagreement between the North and the South finally burst into civil war in April of 1861. Seven states in the South had withdrawn from the Union. Soldiers of the new Confederate States of America shelled the Union base at Fort Sumter, built on an island in Charleston Harbor in South Carolina. They captured Fort Sumter after two days. President Abraham Lincoln asked the states of the Union for 75,000 soldiers to help end the Southern Rebellion. Northern states quickly sent forces to Washington. But border states, those between the North and the South, refused to send any. Some prepared to leave the Union and join the Confederacy. Steve Ember and Shirley Griffith describe the first days of the American Civil War. The first state to secede after the start of the Civil War was Virginia. It was an important state because of its location. It was just across the Potomac River from Washington. Virginia's decision to secede cost the Union a military commander of great ability. He was Robert E. Lee. Lee was a Virginian and had served in the United States Army for more than thirty years. Lincoln asked him to be head of the Army when General Winfield Scott retired. Lee said he could not accept the job. He said he opposed secession and loved the Union. But, he said, he could not make war on his home state. Lee resigned from the army. He did not really want to fight at all. But soon after his resignation, he agreed to command the forces of Virginia. Virginia's forces moved quickly after the state seceded. A group of 1,000 soldiers went to Harper's Ferry, Virginia, where the Union Army had a gun factory and arsenal. It was the same town where abolitionist John Brown 
had tried to start a slave rebellion a few years before. The United States force at Harper's Ferry was small. The soldiers could not defend the town against the Virginians, so they left. Before marching away, the soldiers set fire to the gun factory and arsenal. The fire did not destroy all the equipment at the gun factory. When the Virginians captured the town, they sent the equipment south, where it was used to make guns for Confederate soldiers. Virginia's forces also moved against the United States' biggest Navy base, which was at Norfolk, Virginia. Once again, the Union force withdrew. Before leaving, it burned every building and sank every ship. President Lincoln was becoming increasingly worried about Virginia's military moves. He was afraid Confederate forces in Virginia might try to capture Washington in the first days of the war. After all, the Confederate Secretary of War had declared that the Confederate flag would fly over the Capitol building before the 1st of May. Washington was not strongly defended. It did not have enough soldiers to stop any real attempt by Confederate forces to seize the city. It was extremely important to get more soldiers to Washington as quickly as possible. Thousands of men were on their way to Washington, but they could not get there quickly. Troop trains had to pass through the state of Maryland to get to Washington from the north. Many people in the state supported the Confederacy. The governor, however, did not. He refused to call a meeting of the state legislature. He was afraid it might vote to secede. He wanted to keep Maryland neutral. The first troop train from the north passed through Baltimore, Maryland, without incident. The second train was not so lucky. A mob blocked the rail line and threw stones at the train. Shots were fired. Four soldiers and twelve civilians were killed. State and city officials met to discuss the trouble. They agreed that there would be even more violence in the future. So they ordered railroad bridges outside Baltimore destroyed. No more trains from the north could reach Washington that way. President Lincoln told the officials of the great need to get more soldiers to the capital. He agreed that they did not have to pass through Baltimore. But he wanted them to be able to land safely at Annapolis, a city on the Chesapeake Bay. Landing at Annapolis would be easy. Getting to the capital would not. Supporters of the Confederacy had damaged trains, rail lines, and bridges between the two cities. The first soldiers to land at Annapolis had to repair everything as they moved ahead. Still, with all these difficulties, 10,000 troops made it to Washington in the first few weeks of the Civil War. The city and government were safe. President Lincoln worried about the presence of Confederate supporters in Maryland. He knew they would continue to be a threat to the movement of Union troops and supplies. Lincoln wanted to restrict the activities of the Confederate supporters, so he took an extremely unusual step for an American president. He put much of Maryland under military rule. He gave military officers the power to arrest civilians believed to be hostile to the Union. And he gave them the power to hold these suspects without trial. 
this order suspended two of the basic rights under the Constitution. One was the right to go free until officially charged, and the other was the right to a speedy trial. The Chief Justice of the United States wrote a letter to President Lincoln. He said the Constitution did not give the President the power to suspend the rights of citizens. Lincoln disagreed. He felt the situation facing the Union permitted him to take such strong measures. If he had not acted, he believed, Maryland would have seceded. Maryland did not withdraw, but North Carolina, Tennessee, and Arkansas did. There were now eleven states in the Confederacy. There could be two more. No one knew how long Kentucky and Missouri would remain in the Union. Both supported the Southern rebels. President Lincoln treated Kentucky carefully. He did not want the state to secede, nor did he want it to remain neutral. Kentucky reached from the mountains of Virginia to the Mississippi River. As a neutral state, Kentucky could block northern troops from much of the South. Lincoln wanted it firmly on the side of the Union. The president did not use force in Kentucky as he had done in Maryland. Instead, he sent people to Kentucky to organize support for the Union. Newspapers were urged to publish pro-Union statements. Home Guard forces were formed. They received their weapons and supplies from Lincoln's administration. Lincoln hoped that in time these efforts would win Kentucky's support for his war effort. To decide the question, a majority of the delegates refused to vote for secession. The governor organized state soldiers. The Lincoln administration organized home guard forces. The two sides clashed several times. Some civilians were killed. The United States Army finally seized government buildings in the state capital. They forced state officials, including the governor, to flee. Missouri would remain in the Union. The capital of the Confederate States of America was located far south in Montgomery, Alabama. Within the first few weeks of the Civil War, the Confederate Congress voted to move the capital farther north to Richmond, Virginia. They believed Virginia would be an important battlefield in the war. They were right. Two days before Confederate President Jefferson Davis left for Richmond, Union troops invaded Virginia. They left Washington, crossed the Potomac River, and seized the towns of Arlington and Alexandria. No shots were fired. Confederate forces withdrew as Union troops moved forward. Within a month, Thousands more Union soldiers were in Virginia. They were to prepare for a major battle at a place called Manassas Junction, or Bull Run. And that's our program for today. Listen again tomorrow to learn English through stories from around the world. I'm Jonathan Evans. And I'm Ashley Thompson. Thompson. 